Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us um, for another episode of Emerge. Uh, my name is Trian Stoichev, I'm a part of the Resin Biosciences team. Um, just to start off with the usual housekeeping announcements, we're going to record this session and post it on our YouTube channel uh, in a couple of days. So look out for that. Um, and please post your questions uh, in the Q&A session. We have plenty of time for these. Um, we also encourage you, if you want to have a bit of a discussion, uh, I can activate your mic and you can, you can also ask your question live um, on this forum. Um, so today I have the pleasure of um, hosting um, Tevia Bath from the uh, Novo Nordisk uh, uh, Center for Protein Research in Copenhagen. Uh, Tenvia has extensive experience in proteomics, a lot of them focusing on mesmer based technologies to assess uh, PTMs and downstream cellular signaling pathways, but he's also spent a lot of his time on developing these proteome-wise strategies to uh, characterize um, protein targets from small molecule drugs, and this is the focus of um, today's webinar. So um, Tenvia. Thank you very much for taking some time to talk to us about some of the workflows you've developed and how we improve the efficiency of these um, um, these assays. Yes, thank you, Stoen. I uh, hope everybody can hear me. And yeah, like Stoen said, good morning or uh, good evening, depending on where you are. <laughs> and uh, yes, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to uh, present here. Uh, thanks to Recent Bioscience. Um, I think it's uh, very cool. And um, yeah, I will uh, share my screen now. And, or, yes, there we go. <clears throat> yep, okay. Yes, I hope everybody can see this. And uh, yeah, with that, uh, I'll get started. Um, yes, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about uh, some of the target identification uh, work that uh, I've been doing using some of these um, uh, chemical proteomics based methods. And uh, yes, the title of my talk is uh, Streamlined proteome wide Identification of uh, Drug Targets in the case Oregon Pacific Engagement. Yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of long, <laughs> but I think uh, I just want to start off by saying, um, I think most of us understand that proteins are the primary targets of most drugs and uh, a lot of times it's, uh, it's not possible to uh, really identify or know uh, which uh, proteins are going to be targeted inside the, inside the cells when uh, they're absorbed by the cell, for example. And of course, having an understanding of all the targets uh, could help us uh, do some molecular mechanism of action studies and uh, study how that affects cellular outcomes. But on a more practical level, it can also help us uh, perhaps uh, design better drugs and repurpose uh, existing drugs. And I think this is important because I think uh, there are uh, several indications that, you know, for some of these drugs, uh, we don't actually know, under, know or understand the mechanism of action. And uh, there's some uh, evidence to support this, uh, including this one here, where uh, the authors speculate that, you know, <laughs> off-target effects is actually the common mechanism for some of these uh, cancer drugs. So I think uh, the more you know is, uh, is better. And... Um, of course, I have a bias, but you know, in my opinion, I think to really identify some of these protein targets, you should uh, study the proteins themselves uh, and uh, try to determine and identify these targets directly. Uh, because proteins are inherently very complex, uh, they move in and out of different cellular organelles, they can be modified in different ways, and uh, most proteins are uh, in some kind of a protein-protein interaction with uh, another protein. So it's, uh, it's, it's pretty complicated. And so uh, in that regard, you want to kind of maybe try to study these uh, target interactions uh, in the native environment or as close to the native environment as possible. And there's a lot of methods out there, you know, uh, where you can perhaps uh, try to identify or screen a um, small number of drugs against a large number of proteins. And ideally, what you want to be able to do is basically uh, screen a lot of number, uh, a large number of different proteins against a large number of uh, different drugs. And that was kind of perhaps the motivation for this project, you know, how much, you know, how fast or how much can we push some of these techniques to uh, really do high throughput screening where we can kind of uh, screen a lot of different drugs. 
And I think I just want to start off by saying, you know, no method is, is perfect. Um, you're always going to sacrifice something, you know, whether it's on the sensitivity or the specificity, the speed and depth. And I guess you could add a few more things on here, you know, uh, how easy is the method to use, you know, how practical it is. So in that regard, there is no specific uh, perfect method. And, you know, there are also some advantages and disadvantages to some of these uh, methods uh, that you use. So I think it's also, you know, important to keep that in mind that you're kind of going to have to sacrifice on one of these to, uh, uh, if you want, you know, the the optimal uh, of, of these parameters. So with that in mind, you know, I have been using this uh, method that was uh, originally published, you know, maybe around 10 years ago. Um, it's called thermal aquarium profiling or uh, the cellular thermal shift assay for short, uh, where the basic principle is that um, you, <clears throat> if a drug interacts with a protein, then it will change its melting point. And the melting point is uh, the temperature at which the half 50% of the protein is, is, uh, is stabilized. Many the other 50% has been destabilized or become unsoluble. And so the thermal shift assays traditionally, they've been used in the drug uh, development and also just protein uh, biochemical uh, industries or resource settings to basically uh, determine whether a ligand is uh, interacting with a drug. And normally it's purified and then you would look at, study the thermal uh, shifts of these uh, proteins and try to figure out if you know the inhibitor is specific and generate maybe IC50 curves, for example. But in this case, you apply that to the whole proteome. And so in that case, I think the technique is, is very powerful and, uh, and uh, I think it's really cool, especially thermal proteome profiling where you can kind of do these assays on whole protein extracts or, or even in cells and kind of screen all the proteins uh, that you identify uh, to see whether or not they're a target of uh, different drugs. With that, you know, being said, the tar the technique is, you know, it is a bit extensive. It's, it's, it's it takes a lot of, um, it has a lot of steps and there's a lot of uh, room for error. So it does take some um, uh, practice and, you know, it, it does take some uh, getting used to. And I won't really go into, you know, all the steps, but I think this was really highlighted by uh, um, these authors here that kind of uh, developed a simpler version of the thermoporium profiling where instead of trying to de determine the melting point and measure the difference in its melting points, you integrate the area under the curve, in this case, the melting curve. <clears throat> and then you look at, you know, then you, then it becomes, instead of trying to find uh, the melting curve and compare the melting points, you just look at the abundance changes between uh, treated and untreated. And if that changes, then that would indicate whether the protein is uh, stabilized or destabilized uh, in short. But as you can see here, even on this uh, figure, um, there's a lot of steps. And uh, just practically speaking, I don't know if some of you maybe have some experience with it. Um, it can be quite laborious. For example, here you have you know two drugs. You have to heat them at 10 different temperatures. Um, in this case, it's a bit simpler than standard TPP. You pull all the different temperatures, but then you have to centrifuge, and then you have to remove the uh, supernatant in equal volumes. You digest, and then you have to label with TMT, and uh, you mix again, and then you fraction it. So as you can see, it's it's not really high throughput, and it is uh it can take a, a bit while to really uh, screen a lot of dr different drugs, and so that was what I was trying to see. You know, can we do this a little bit faster based on using this technique? And in essence, like as I mentioned, the PISA technique, you integrate the uh, the the curve, the peak area, by based on three different points, or different temperature points, and the original authors they had ten different uh, temperature points. Uh, I want to see if you can go even lower, and you know to maybe streamline emulate streamline it a little bit more, and uh, that was uh, <clears throat> and that's what I did. Uh, and then one way we can test this is based, basically using a non-specific inhibitor. Uh, where we know some of the targets. For example, uh, I use Torosporin, and I think a lot of other groups use it as well. It's kind of a nice positive control because uh, it targets uh, a lot of different kinases non-specifically. So uh, you can kind of use this uh, compound to kind of benchmark your technique. And for me, it's, it's worked really well. And basically what that means is uh, you should see more kinase targets uh, with the, when you treat the cells or uh, cellular extracts with this compound. And so what I did in this case was I did a standard TPP, 10 temperatures, 
uh, but I used only three temperatures at maybe the high range from 53 degrees to 59 degrees to do a TPP pizza. So uh, a bit more, uh, a bit less temperatures, but a bit simpler. So as I mentioned in the standard uh, TPP approach, you would basically, uh, each replicate will be run independently. And then if this is a TMT based setup, in each run, you each uh, TMT channel represents a different temperature. And then basically you run those and you compare the melting points and that will indicate whether or not uh, a certain protein is a target or not. Whereas in the PISA approach, you basically look at the abundance difference. So you can, in essence, do, uh, um, yeah, however many TMT plexes you have, you can have that many replicates or experiments in, in that single run. So it, it's a lot It's a lot faster. You basically cut down on your uh, acquisition time by maybe, uh, yeah, factor of uh, 10 or something like that. And when I did this experiment, I could <clears throat> uh, right away see that the, with the PISA approach, you identify more uh, kinases, uh, meaning more kinase targets. Basically, uh, here is the standard TPP approach. And perhaps this is not a, you know, a fair direct comparison because with TPP, you're actually comparing the melting points between stars born and DMSO treated. Uh, whereas in the TPP PISA approach, you're comparing the differences, the abundance differences. <clears throat> but you can see here uh, the negative log 10 uh, p-values are plotted. They have the same scale. And based on that, you can see uh, um, many more kinases are identified. And uh, so these are uh, from the same sample as well. I just split them uh, for these three temperatures where I use for the pizza. And you can see that you know we identify many more kinases, suggesting it's a fairly robust technique and uh, while having the benefits of... Um, um, <clears throat> Of, uh, of identifying more kinases. Um, to go along with that, I really want to skip the TMT labeling as well, because uh, if I go back a few slides, you can see uh, over here, you have to label uh, every single sample with a dif different TMT channel. And so uh, I decided to use uh, DIA approach. Um, sorry, I think I have an old version of, uh, <laughs> of my uh, presentation here, but Advantages of the uh, DIA is basically um, it's it's been a lot of uh, um, advances in the technique, and especially with some of these modern mass spectrometers, you get a lot of uh, less missing values, but you also get a um, high number of protein identification and also fairly robust protein quantitation. So that's very attractive for me. So that's why uh, I decided to utilize uh, uh, the DIA approach going forward instead of the standard TMT. And one other uh, approach I really wanted to tackle was removing the insoluble proteins. I mentioned that's also one of the steps in the workflow in the traditional TPP, but it's, it's also very low throughput. Uh, what I mean by that is after you uh, temperature treat your cells or your uh, cellular extracts, you have to separate the soluble proteins, which you measure um, from your insoluble. And if you're using centrifugation-based approaches, so normally you will centrifuge at 20,000 to 100,000 Gs. And that limits the number of samples you can do at a time, even with the PISA approach. You know, it can be anywhere from six to 30 samples, depending on the centrifuge. And I have read upon that certain groups like the Svisky group have been using filter plates as well in some of their publications. And uh, I hadn't really seen a direct comparison. So I went ahead and uh, compared uh, the two uh, for using the PISA approach. And, and yeah, I could immediately see that the filter plates actually work fairly well compared to uh, centrifugation at 20,000 Gs. And uh, in this case, these are also the same samples, meaning uh, they were treated with starosporin or with DMSO, and then I split them between centrifugation or filtration to remove the insoluble proteins. And I think the advantages of this is that basically in a two and a half minute uh, uh, centrifugation step, you can process 96 samples in parallel. Whereas with certification, it's a bit more limited and it takes longer. And the results speak for themselves. So you can see uh, many more regulated kinases. And also you get them with the better statistical uh, um, cutoffs as well. So with that in mind, I basically went ahead and tried to automate the, the entire workflow in a 96 well play based format. Basically, what I do is uh, I have a 96 well, uh, well played where I put the protein extracts in, and then I also have a plate with uh, different compounds. 
that uh, are, are also in an ISIX well plate, and then I use a multi channel to transfer the compounds into the plates with the extracts. I do the, and then the plates are also in ISIX, uh, sorry, PCR plates. And then I put the plate in a PCR machine and heat them at the three different temperatures. And after the heating, I pull the uh, the temperatures in a single uh, in a single uh, well for each sample, and then I transfer to the nice six well uh, filter plate, uh, I, which is also collected in a new uh, nice six well plate, and in which I do the pack uh, lysine and uh, trips and overnight digestion. And from there, it's uh, it's a matter for certification, and I transfer a small amount to the Evo tips, also in nice six well based uh, format and then analyze on the mass spectrometer running in the DIA uh, mode. And I process the data. And so all the data I'm gonna show uh, well, in regards to D DIA has been processed using the Diane uh, um, uh, 1.8 version software. So based on uh, these developments, I try to basically do everything in 96 well plates. And, um, and we also want to basically and uh, see if we can use uh, rat organ extracts to do some of these experiments because uh, they're uh, animal. They're a very great uh, animal cl cl clinical model that uh, most uh, many researchers use to do drug studies. So I think it made sense uh, in that case just to see if it's, it's even possible. And so what we did was we first perfused the rats and then we extract the the organs and uh, extract the the proteins under native conditions. And then I basically, uh, using star sporing, just did the same test as I did uh, previously to see whether or not if there's any activity. And the activity, I guess, is just on based on if you identify stars uh, kinase uh, targets or not. And uh, of, of that, which we did, we can see that we actually uh, uh, found targets uh, across the different kinase families. And um, here's some subset of some of these targets. And you can see, uh, for example, some kinases, uh, uh, red, of course, means uh, temperature destabilized. Some of the, the blue ones are temperature destabilized. You can see you can kind of uh, find them across uh, different uh, organ extracts and, and also two human cell lines. So that was pretty nice. Um, but I think there's also some interesting stuff here already. You can see some of these kinases, uh, uh, even though they're temperature destabilized in one, biological uh, background, they are de uh, stabilizing another. So um, it's also something interesting uh, just to uh, keep in mind that maybe, you know, uh, it uh, supports using different biological backgrounds to do some of these type of uh, experiments. <clears throat> so we're using the same workflow. And uh, once uh, uh, we confirmed that, you know, there were, we could find some of these uh, star sporing uh, targets indicating that these slices could be used for these type of experiments. Uh, I went ahead and tested basically around 20 different compounds uh, spanning different uh, clinical indications just to see uh, what we can get. And, uh, and we want to kind of generate a semi-high uh, um, large database to see, uh, you know, if you could develop also some um, bioinformatics and downstream uh, uh, analysis strategies. And so I did around 20 different compounds, as I just mentioned, some of these were done in more than one concentration. And we did this in different uh, rat organs and also uh, two different human cell lines. And so basically we had a large data set. And what I really want to do was similar, inspired by some of these uh, large scale IP studies is basically use the entire data set for each drug as a control so that uh, we can get maybe uh, higher statistical uh, power when we do some of the analysis to find uh, novel uh, um, targets. And what we came up with um, is uh, actually Marie, uh, who's also co-author on this uh, study, she came up with this uh, Tanimoto index, which I think is, uh, is, is really cool. Basically uh, using uh, um, the structure of the, if each drug, you can predict how similar they are to each other. And if they're too similar, you can basically exclude them from, their, uh, from the control group. Uh, let me just give you an example. For example, you have a SHIP99 here, which is a PTPN11 uh, inhibitor. And this is also a PTPN11 inhibitor. You can see that um, it's, they're very similar in structure, even though they're different compounds. Uh, they will be excluded from the control group when we look for targets in here. So basically, if you're looking for SHIP99 targets, you would use the whole data set as a control, but you would exclude uh, this compound in the control. So we use that a cutoff of 0.6 if they're based on the similarity to exclude certain uh, compounds. 
but we also uh, excluded compounds if they shared uh, common targets based on drugcentral.org database, meaning you know if they were associated or there's some uh, back background known uh, targets for some of these drugs, they would also be excluded. So that was pretty nice, and that kind of allowed us to uh, really uh, use the entire data set to analyze each compound with higher statistical confidence. And just uh, when, we, when we did this entire experiment, uh, just a general observation, uh, I don't want to go into it too much, but in general, it seemed like we seem to find that proteins are more destabilized when you uh, treat these extracts with uh, compounds rather than uh, temperature stabilized. And I'll touch back on this a little bit in, uh, in a few minutes when I sh share some results, but it's just something, it's an interesting observation. I think it's, it's maybe good, good to keep in mind for now. And we can come, so using this strategy, uh, for example, cobotinib, which is a MAP2K1 uh, and 2 inhibitor, we could find that it was uh, targeting, uh, it's an intended target in rat muscle, for example. Um, here's a volcano from that, uh, uh, from the same same run. And, uh, and we did this for all different drugs. And if they pass a certain threshold, they would be considered target. So we basically had a very large database of all these drugs across all different uh, different targets. And we basically want to visualize them. And the approach we went with, uh, working with Lars and Nadia and Marie and Tim was uh, obviously using uh, uh, network visualization. And uh, I think this is really cool. For example, we have uh, here Kobotnip and we also have um, colored, the, the lines here are colored indicating which organ they were found in. For example, pink is uh, rat muscle. So in, you know this protein was found to be a target in rat muscle. Um, we also have information about the known targets based on the drug central database. So for example, this MAP2K1 and MAP2K2 uh, are known targets. So they are uh, marked in a gray box. And also BRAF is based on drug central, uh, it's known to be a target, but it was not found in this case. Um, so it stays uh, black and kind of this uh, diamond shape. And um, so I think this is a very cool way to visualize some of these uh, targets. Um, I thought about maybe I can just uh, show you guys the actual Cytoscape network, which uh, we'll also be sharing with the preprint. And so I think I'm just gonna stop sharing now and just, uh, share the Cytoscape network with you really quick. Yes. I hope you can see this. Yep, coming through nicely. Yeah. So yeah, you can see I have the different drugs here and here's the network for Kobotnib and you can uh, click on the different edges and see uh, which one it is. And uh, you can go through different drugs. There's a lot of cool targets. Um, one thing I forgot to mention, we also have information whether or not the protein target was temperature destabilized or destabilized. If it's an arrow, that means that this target was actually temperature um, stabilized by whatever drug is uh, connected to. And if it's a uh, square, um, like in this case here, you can see it's, uh, it was temperature destabilized. So yeah, there's a lot of cool... Uh, um, uh, networks we have here, I think this is uh, really nice and it's very easy to actually fall in a rabbit hole chasing some of these targets that look interesting. And uh, yeah, before you know it, you know you have to pick up your child from daycare. Um, anyways, uh, yes, this networks will be available as well. Uh, so please check it out. Uh, I think it's really cool. <clears throat> uh, okay, back to the presentation. Yes. Uh, we also uh, were able to map uh, homolog proteins uh, into the networks as well. For example, this uh, cytochrome uh, protein is a known target of ibuprofen based on drug central. Even though we don't identify this particular target in the data set, we do identify targets which are some of its homologs. So I think that's also a nice way to kind of maybe find some of these uh, associated targets as well. Uh, we also uh, were able to visualize uh, cross-drug targets, meaning uh, proteins that have uh, the same targets between uh, two different drugs. For example, here's naproxen and ibuprofen, and they have some shared targets here um, that we can easily see. 
So I think this is a very nice way to basically visualize a lot of information from you know many different drugs and organs into into a single network. And um, so the next step was to basically validate some of these targets that we found. Um, uh, one of the attractive candidates was, of course, something that hasn't been known before, but also you know something you can perhaps uh, purchase as a recombinant protein. And one of the targets that uh, we decided to try was this protein called purin, which was found to be a target of ibuprofen in different uh, biological extracts at relatively high conditions. And so uh, we were able to uh, basically assay its, uh, um, its uh, specificity or its interaction using surface plasma resonance. And we did see that it seems to follow a dose-dependent response to ibuprofen. It's not the strongest uh, interaction, but I think uh, that's not perhaps to be uh, that's not too unexpected because ibuprofen is a very um, it's a very uh, small compound. It's not a it's not expected to have perhaps a very specific target, and it's more like a fragment. But nonetheless, we can pick up some of these uh, small. Uh, uh, interactions. Okay. Uh, we also uh, tried to validate a, a common target that was uh, destabilized. Um, for example, this lysosomal protein uh, beta hexos, uh, hexos amino aminidase uh, was found to be destabilized in uh, quite a few different uh, uh, um, biological backgrounds. Um, however, when I did the activity assay on recombinant uh, uh, hex B, I uh, actually found that it's not that specific, and actually perhaps the, the signal we're getting is, is not a, could be an artifact of the assay, or it could be uh, due to some uh, downstream effects, whether it's perturbations to uh, protein, protein interactions that cause this, or, or something downstream. And the way I did that was basically I checked that using this beta uh, hex B assay and the natural uh, acidity of the lysosome is, is is around pH four to five, and so you can see that you know when you do this assay under uh, um, low pH conditions, you don't really see uh, uh, a response. And this was also um, what I saw in some of the extracts as well. So something to keep in mind, you know, uh, some of these targets may not be direct targets. And that's also uh, is, is uh, something I touched on earlier, where uh, some of these destabilized targets, you know, which might seem initially like targets could actually be something that's a bit downstream. Um, I think it probably requires uh, a further inquiry to basically uh, um, uh, study uh, this process. So I think uh, with that, I will just uh, wrap up. Um, basically, uh, we present uh, a combined experimental and bioinformatics strategy to identify drug targets. Uh, I think the PISA method is, is is really great, and I think if you couple that to DIA uh, analysis, is uh, it seems to work really well. And uh, of course, when you're doing large scale bioinformatics analysis, uh, I think if you can use the entire data set to control each drug, that will really increase the statistical power of your analysis. But you have to maybe uh, take into account that you don't include drugs that might have similarly fair targets. Um, and yes. Uh, uh, protein uh, and drug target networks, I think, is a very nice way to visualize uh, some of this information. And of course, you should validate everything. And uh, like I said, no method method is perfect. Um, but you know, if you can uh, validate some of these targets, uh, it's, it's, it's always recommended. And yes, this paper is uh, on BioArchive now, so please check it out. Um, I'll be updating it at some point. There are some. Uh, uh, small errors I need to uh, fix. Um, but if you have any questions, feel free to uh, reach out and ask. I mean, I think uh, with a lot of these uh, methods, you know, sometimes uh, you might miss a certain detail or something when you're writing up the materials and methods. A lot of times these, uh, these type of protocols are more for art than the science. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to uh, contact me. And with that, I would like to thank uh, everyone on the team. Uh, especially Marie, who really developed the, the data analysis strategy to find the targets, and, uh, and also to Nadia for the network analysis that we did. And I'd like to thank Blanca, um, who did the surface, surface plasma resonance on the, on the HexB protein, and also Stasia, 
who will provide the rat where so we could do these experiments. And also Lars Juliensen, who also uh, contributed to the developing the data analysis and effort strategy. And uh, of course, uh, Jesper uh, Olsen, who uh, uh, also uh, uh, supervised this project and uh, really helped guide uh, which direction to take this in and uh, and uh, provided us uh, with the resource to carry this out at the Center of Approach and Research. And um, with that, uh, thank you for uh, your time and uh, I'll answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Tenvia. It was a great presentation, and I, I really like that you making all the data available for for people to to browse uh, to the Cytoscape uh, interface and uh, hopefully yeah. not forget their kids. Yeah, it, they yeah, can. it will be there's this Nodo uh, link in the in the data availability section, but I don't think it's updated yet. We're trying to fix that because the apparently you can get two different DUI identifies for this. So uh, just have some patience. Uh, we'll have that up at some point. Cool. That sounds great. So um, it's quite a few questions that come in. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe you can, we can jump into those uh, immediately. Um, so the first one is about kind of the, the essay description. Essentially, why, why is it called TPP? PISA and not just TPP or PISA, given that PISA is based on suitability of proteins and does not establish thermal stability. So maybe to go a little bit back and kind of describe the two differences between the two essays and kind of how you combine everything. Yeah, yeah, I can do that. I mean, uh, basically, uh, TPP is a standard thermal prion profiling, which is based on SESTA. I think it's a bit confusing with some of these terms. And uh, I also don't know which one to reference, to be honest, like should I use SESTA or TPP? And so I think I try to play it safe and just call it TPP pizza. But I think um, uh, uh, probably you want to use pizza for uh, the type of assay I'm doing, even though you know the concept is based on a little bit on thermal shift assays and, um, and uh, Profiling, uh, not necessarily the thermal proteome or thermal. Sh we're not measuring the, exactly the melting curve. It's just uh, integrating. So perhaps pizza is, is, is the best way to uh, uh, reference it. Cool. Um, that's another question. And this is something we touched upon just before we started the webinar is, is about the extraction. So um, what buffer do you do ex extraction? Do you have detergents and do they create artifacts? Uh, when hidden, how do you avoid it? Yes, uh, that's a very good question. And I think uh, I'll get back to, you know, uh, no method is perfect. So in this case, uh, I was using NP40, normally uh, 0.2% or 0.4%. Sorry, I can't recall on top of my head. But a little bit of NP40 that in theory helps solubilize some of the membrane or uh, organelle proteins, um, but it's not perfect. You definitely have a bias against uh, membrane proteins. And um, they can definitely perhaps create some artifacts, uh, you know, when they're heated. So you can't account for everything, but I mean, you have the control. So uh, in theory, you know, the artifacts will be in all the different conditions. So because um, all of them will have the same uh, background in theory. But yes, I mean, you can't really uh, avoid that other than just have good controls. Just maybe from my side, related to this, do you have to have any tips and tricks when you are uh, processing the data in terms of normalization or extended medium based uh, normalization works? I suppose because um, you're pulling everything together, you, you dip, you, you're not worried too much about one condition having much less protein with the high temperatures. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, uh, the Diane normalization works pretty well. Um, I think it's a little bit somewhat based on the median uh normalization but then uh, <clears throat> we do uh the way we did the data analysis is uh, we did it per plate so basically each experiment was uh analyzed kind of together and uh and then kind of merged separately from different experiments and each experiment was basically um half the drugs you know in in each different organ extracts um so we do normally did that and then we kind of did a medium extraction um um, to basically do the normalization on the Diane data, process data. And uh, we did some statistical cutoffs, uh, um, basically a full change of 0 0.5 and a p-value of uh, less than 0 0.05. Yep. 
Cool. <clears throat> Another question, and this is uh, suppose when it uh, comes to the um, translation from the rat database to human and uh, regards to homologs. Um, yes. Is it from drug center or other experimental data perhaps from existing literature? Yeah. So that's a good question. Um, first, uh, let me maybe address the, the rat question because that was actually a challenge initially. And uh, that's actually something Nadia figured out very well. Um, because the rat, at least the last time I checked, and that was quite a while ago, maybe it's updated now. The rat proteome on union protein is only like 8,000 or something uh, proteins uh, that are like accurately annotated. Right, so we didn't really use the union pro rat um, program. We used the ensemble rat program, which is uh, in theory should be a um, a better, a more up to date um, uh, FASA. Uh, so what we had to do was basically uh, transfer the the rat hits to their human orthologs, and that was uh, and that's what we did first. And it's not perfect, so sometimes they would not maybe necessarily match one to one, but it was good enough. Now, in regards to the protein homologs, which are similar proteins uh, um, based on sequence um, to each other, that was from Drug Central. And I'm not exactly sure how, uh, uh, sorry, no, the homologs not, were not from Drug Central. Those are known targets. The homologs were based on sequence. And I don't know on top of my head how it was exactly done by Nadia, but it's in the materials and methods. But basically, it was using like an R package that we, uh, we're able to um, uh, to figure out uh, different homologs, but yeah, it's not perfect, but it is um, better than using the Uniprod uh, faster, for sure. Okay. Cool. Uh, next one, common vein visualization tanks. Did you compare the difference of PISA with more temperatures and uh, one with three? So yes, the full uh, melting curve versus one yeah. regarding three, and how does that compare? And then. Um, uh, is the is overall the differences in the steps of aliquoting the number of temperatures? Or is that the main difference between the the two approaches in terms of what you gain versus the potentially what you lose if you go yeah. one way or another? Yeah, I think the main thing is uh, number of temperatures. I think that's the main uh, main advantage, but also uh, not having to do a TMT labeling, and also being able to remove the insoluble with the filter plate. I think those are the uh, the main uh, differences. Um, but yeah, it's a good question. You know, I tested three. Um, maybe I can just share my screen briefly again. Um, you could probably optimize this a bit more and, uh, and you know, use maybe less temperatures. But I compared maybe two or three different ranges, and this one seemed to work the best. Um, the reason I chose this range specifically was basically based on the melting point ranges on, based on some of these publications uh, previously at the time. And you can see the medium temperature was... You know, the melting point was normally between 50 and 55. So I try to pick something a little bit in this range, a little bit higher, um, because uh, I guess I was biasing myself towards um, more temperature uh, stabilized uh, proteins. But, you know, given the data, perhaps it might make sense to go the other way as well. Um, but it seems to work good enough. And I think uh, and so we kind of just stuck with that. But yeah, there's definitely uh, room for improvement, I'm sure. Yeah, great. So I mean, so you, if I had to summarize the the main kind of steps where you've taken the the throughput high is the removing of the uh, of the ninety six hole format of the precipitants proteins yeah. going DIA and uh, essentially doing the less uh, less uh, melting temperatures. Yeah. So essentially exactly. less runs on the mass spec. Um, yeah. yeah. So everything is done in 96 four plates. Uh, see, obviously, I think the, the pack part of the workflow is easily automatable. Is, yeah, is that something yeah, they've automated yeah. already, or you're also doing it in manual formats? How does that work? Yeah, I mean, you could do it with a Kingfisher. Yeah, that's yeah. Fine. Yeah. A yeah. uh, question on 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 the on the data position. Uh, what was the width that you use for the DA windows? Uh, that's a good course? question. I don't know on top of my head, but I think it's the standard. Um, because this data was collected over like, the initial data was collected like late 2017, early 2018. So we were working with the HFX back then. But some of the earlier stuff was DDA, like doing the TMT, uh, TPP versus pizza comparisons. Um, but some of the DIA stuff, I believe was run on the explorers and I believe the widths were like 13.5 or six uh, uh, yeah. Dalton windows, the typical uh, from like 400 to 900. 
Um, I can get the specifics for you um, if you want for this uh, question, uh, questioner. Yeah, great. Question on the removal of the insoluble stuff with the photo plates. Was there any mm -hmm. molecular weight cutoffs or just side cutoff? Um, do you use specific resin in the plates or just the yeah. normal photo plates? Yeah. Uh, I used the hydrophilic plate, um, but I didn't do uh, extensive comparison with different plate chemistries. So the cutoff is a 0 0.45. So it's not a molecular weight uh, based cutoff. It's basically 0 0.45 micron. And that seemed to be sufficient. Um, I will say that uh, I actually tested some of these 384 well plates, which are surprisingly hard to uh, get your hands on. And I actually tried it in those. And it didn't really seem to work with uh, some of these very small uh, 384 based filter plates. So it seems like you have to work with some of these 96 well plates, which uh, unfortunately requires a little bit more material. I think uh, you want to have at least 50 micrograms of protein because when you're doing the filtering, uh, the filter plate also absorbs a certain amount of uh, um, material as well. So, um, but I think, um, yeah, so it's not based on molecular weight cutoff. I think 0 0.45 hydrophilic plate seems to work. And in the materials and methods, I think I have the exact plate that I use. So you can try that out. But I haven't tried so I haven't compared too many different plates uh, per se. Yeah, no, that's great. And it's actually thinking about this, I mean, you've you've obviously developed the the pack protocol and you worked with it a lot. Do you think if if proteins are already in, aggregated in solution, yeah, and then you generate you put them onto the on 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 beads, would you then would those would those aggregates stay in solution and you just capture the soluble stuff effectively? Then removing the need to filter, or yeah. it's gonna be that's uh, going to stick to the beads. That's an excellent question, and that's something I did try, but it didn't really seem to work. Um, I haven't tried different types of beads, so I think, I think uh, maybe the pack protocol works when you have large number of uh, or large percentage of the protein being precipitated, because I feel like there's a point where it starts to precipitate. It just captures everything on its uh, on itself. And I think when you do this temperature stabilization, it's perhaps not that uh, intense, especially in the ranges uh, we're working in. Of course, when you go to maybe 80 degrees or something, then you basically destabilize the whole uh, prorium and then you can capture it on the on the beads. But in this range, it didn't really seem to work because I that's what I was initially thinking as well. Is maybe I can just use the beads to remove the aggregates. Oh. So you don't even need a filter place at all. But yes. it was not as effective. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. And so maybe, maybe another question, and there's something you know, to talk you know, offline is, and maybe you touched on it, is, is how do you differentiate between uh, on-target and off-target effects? Um, yeah. and, and, and the reason behind most of the targets being destabilized versus stabilized, what, what do you think is happening? Yeah, that's a good question. And, you know, uh, I thought about this as well. And in this case, we don't really differentiate, you know, what's... Uh, you know, off target and was, was not a on target. I mean, what we have is basically data suggesting something that's temperature destabilized or stabilized in one way or another. I think what we can speculate on is that typically, and I've talked to, I've, you know, I have some conversation with some biophysicists that use, uh, you know, the traditional thermal shift assay or, you know, some of its variations, like I think it's called differential spanning fluoro fluorometric fluorometry where you basically uh, unfold a protein with the um, higher temperature and then you measure the relative flu fluorescence based on the amino acids. And basically um, you get this curve and then if there's like a drug bound, then the curve is also a little bit delayed. And what they all seem to say is like, you know, uh, most of the time when they check for, you know, these uh, ligand interactions or between the protein and the target or a small molecule or something, the typically the shifts are to the right suggesting it's a direct target. And it's very rare to get a shift to the left. Um, typically, you know, they said something, when something like that happens, is, is you know, maybe an insoluble patch was exposed due to some interaction with a drug or ligand, and that makes it more unstable. Um, in this case, it could be, you know, this is due to protein-protein interactions being perturbed somehow during, uh, caused by drug treatment that basically makes them less temperature stable. So, that's, you know, uh, what we can kind of speculate on that perhaps some of these uh, de temperature uh, destabilized targets are maybe uh, part of some protein-protein network that gets perturbed, but it's hard to say for certain. I think there could certainly be cases where 
you know, the protein uh, temperature destability is caused by natural uh, interaction, but I think uh, it's something that requires maybe further study at this point. Yeah, yeah. that's uh, that's a good point. Yeah. I mean, the, the other thing is, I'm just thinking, maybe it's a silly question, but when I was doing my, my PhD many, many years ago, we were doing a structural biology lab, and so we used to obviously look at proteins from stability perspective when you used to... Um, used skeotrops, urea and guanidinium yeah. hydrochloride. Yeah. So is that something people use instead of temperature to see if, if you know, if you um, incubate them in the drug and then use a different type of denaturant temperature, if that's going to, you know, give the same targets or even different targets because the mechanism of, of stabilization might be, yeah. might be different. Yeah, I think uh, there are different ways to do this. I think one of these ways is basically you unfold it and then you... Um, uh, basically uh, add something like hydrogen peroxide and then uh, you basically look at the met like the oxidation rates of uh, different proteins uh, which might indicate you know the protein is a target or not you know if it's uh, unfolded I mean there's ways there's some ways where people unfold the protein and refold it and uh, so there's different ways to I think do this but I think uh, the advantages of the pizza and the TPP based approach is you can kind of remove the insoluble fraction easily oh. when you have something like urea or something then it's a bit hard um to kind of uh, differentiate between those two uh, in that yeah. case you know you might do something similar to like uh limited proteolysis or something yes. so yeah you know it really depends on your uh, on the context um but yeah you might need to try a couple of different methods cool so um thank you i let's see let's see if there's any more questions guys if you got questions we have time so um uh, there's one more that came in. You can also do pizza with solvent and keotropic ions. Ion. So thank yeah. you. So yeah, yeah. that's uh, that's useful. So um, if anybody's got any more questions, uh, let me know. Otherwise, we can start wrapping it up. Um, yeah, it's been really great to have you come and present some of your work, and I hope this was very helpful for everybody else. And we look out for you know, remaining of the data that you're going to upload and to start yeah. playing around with that. Um, yeah, and uh, I want to thank you all for coming along oh, and yes, hopefully have another webinar soon. Yes, and thank you for uh, giving me an uh, opportunity to present uh, my work here and uh, apologies for one of the slides uh, <laughs> at the wrong uh, presentation, but uh, hopefully I got the point across. Uh, yeah, DIA is better than TMT. Yeah. <laughs> At least in this case, point, in my point opinion. taken. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> cool. Thank you, Tenvia, and thank you, yes. everyone. And thank we'll you. see you guys soon. Have a nice day. Bye bye.